I'm going to invite Bob and Joanna uh, to come to the stage, and uh, it's our privilege to have them here with us today. Let's welcome them to the stage. And um, what you may not know is that in 1982, and I know it's hard to believe because we look so young, but in 1982, Kim and I met Bob and Joanna. We were freshmen together in Bible college. And uh, please do not ask Bob about things about me from the past. Anything he tells you, I'm going to just say right up front, is a lie. All right? It is not true. Do not believe it. All right? That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. All right? So, but anyway, Bob and Joanna, um, man, uh, they started out in education, and uh, God just worked in their heart. Bob was a basketball coach and an athletic director, and he got so involved. And it was a missions trip that God really began to work in his life about uh, going and investing his life. He and Joanna going and investing their lives in something that really matters, something that makes a difference. And so today, Bob's going to tell us some stories. He's going to challenge us as a church uh, on how we can be more involved, how we can make a difference and how we can do something that lasts for all of eternity. Really, this is about evangelism. It's about spreading the good news of Jesus Christ all around the world. Not just about preaching to people, but doing exactly what Jesus did in helping reach people's needs. That opens their life to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so today, what I want to do is I want to pray. And I want you to join me in prayer. We're going to pray for them. And then Joanna and I are going to go down, and Bob's going to take the stage, and uh, he's going to challenge us today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would be with Bob and Joanna and the Children's Resiliency Project there in South Africa. God, I pray, Lord, I've held many of the children we saw in this video when they were little kids. Some were babies. Some were preschool age. Uh, some were kindergartners. And Lord, now, all these years later, we've been able to see so many of them as they're maturing and they're entering into adulthood. God, I pray that you just uh, continue to bless them. Continue to bless their lives. Continue to bless this project. Continue to include people from churches and organizations and businesses and individuals around the world that you would challenge them to give to this project and others, God, that are going to solve these problems. But Lord, help us all to know that the gospel is the most important part. And it's not just our standing on the corner and preaching to people but it's living it out. It's being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. It is investing into people's needs and showing the love of Jesus that help us, helps us reach people, uh, not just here at home, but around the world. God, I pray that our church would be uh, just convinced and convicted, God, that our job is not just to worship together, not just to hang out together, not just to do church together on weekends, but Lord, to spread the good news of Jesus Christ around the world. I pray that in this church, you would raise up people that are going to be missionaries, that are going to invest their lives, that are going to make a difference in the world. I pray that every person in our church, Lord, would be those that invite so that the people can come and hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Inviting is evangelism. And God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you'd bless Bob and Joanna and their children. Be with them, Lord, as there have been many sacrifices they have made. But, Lord, we know that every sacrifice they have made has been worth it. And in eternity, it is going to be incredible, incredible what we know, what you reveal to us and how we are able to look back on the investment that we have made. God, we want you to know that we love you today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. All right, Joanna and I are going to go down and sit in the audience here. Let's give Bob and Joanna a hand uh, for being here with us today. 
Well, you're either going to be really excited that you came or you're going to be upset and wish you had stayed home. And there's no going to be in between with me. Uh, I'm going to teach you a little bit this morning. I don't know why you came to church, but I'm going to probably teach you some things you probably wouldn't have thought that when you got up this morning, I'm going to go to church and learn a little things. I'm going to teach you how to gamble a little bit. I, I was uh, amazed when I came over here uh, prior to Christmas, uh, the NFL playoffs were going on, and I was amazed at the number of advertisements uh, on sheer gambling. And I found out the NFL and all these sports programs are sponsored by gambling organizations, you know. You, and I remember about 10 years ago, you can never do this. And they wonder why people, some of their own play, like, uh, for example, I think the Major League Baseball at some point is going to have to apologize to Pete Rose and say, listen, we're going to go ahead and let you come to the Hall of Fame. We apologize for all this stuff. We know you were involved in gambling a little bit. And now we just want to say we're sorry, forgive us. We're going to bring you in the Hall of Fame. There's an element in gambling uh, called a hedge bet. Now, I know I'm not a gambler, okay? When I say I'm not a gambler, I might bet you a dollar here or there playing golf or something. But as far as, you know, taking my hard-earned money and throwing it away, you got to be kidding me. Playing the lottery, you'll never see me play the lottery, okay? You know, uh, you know, you know, your chances of going out and getting struck by lightning on a sunny day are are greater than you uh, being able to win that stuff. But anyway, I, I know... That's not the topic, but I, I want you to understand there's this thing called hedge bet. Now, a hedge bet is one of those things that uh, gamblers do where they place an opposite bet that directly conflicts their original bet. And you say, now, why would somebody do that? Well, there's a number of reasons, but the main reason somebody would place a hedge bet is just to s- somehow minimize their losses or somehow guarantee some sort of victory. You follow me? Now, About six years ago in South Africa, I like to play golf. And about six years ago, I uh, just came in a normal round of golf, and sometimes I stick around. They have prize givings at the clubhouse. Now, if I'm not in the prizes, I'm going to be honest, I usually go home. I have a family. I have things to do. But if you're in the prizes, it's somewhat rude when you have corporate sponsors that sponsor the prize giving, and you win, and you're not there. I get it. But most people that hang around the clubhouse, they drink. You know, they like to come in after a round of golf and, you know, have a a nice cold one. I don't drink. In South Africa, they refer to me as a teetotaler. You know what a teetotaler is, right? I I have a cup of tea. You know, I have some water. I might have a soda every now and then, but I don't drink. And these guys drink for hours. And uh, so if I'm around there, you'll see me. I'm an oddball. I'll sit there and they'll say, okay, give me a cold brew. You know, I'll say, hey, I'll take a cup of tea. And they'll bring me a cup of tea. And they say, oh, Bob's a teetotaler. I don't mind. I don't get caught up in all that pressure to drink. But I'll stick around for prize giving. Well, this particular occasion, and, 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 the, and listen, church, I'm going to be honest with you. One of, the, one of the most disgraceful things that somebody can say to you as a believer if they've worked with you for a period of time or if they've uh, participated with you for any length of time or known you for a length of time is to come up to you and say this, these tragic words. Oh, I didn't know you were a believer. Or I didn't know you were a Christian. Think about how horrific that is as a believer for somebody that you've known for a while to come up and be able to say that to you. Well, these golfers, these fellow golfers that, I, that I've been playing with golf, because I try to play at least once a week. Okay, it's good exercise. I don't have a golf cart. I walk. It's exercise, you know. <laughs> it's not driving around in a cart. But anyway, that's an American thing. But I digress. So, uh, so I play golf, but you know, not once I've ever played golf, Pastor Richie, that I've ever carried my Bible. You know, I haven't gone on the tee box and say, bless God, before we tee off, can we have a word of prayer? People that go to play golf didn't go there to go to a church service. I came to play golf. But over the years, by and large, every member of that golf course knows I'm a Christian. I've never told them I was a Christian. I never brought my Bible. I've never done any of that. But the Bible tells you this, by their fruits, you'll know them. See, some people say, we need to preach the gospel. And most scripture verses talk about preaching the gospel. There is one book that doesn't talk about preaching the gospel. He's a little bit different. His name is James. See, James saying preaching the gospel 
is one thing, but living the gospel is totally different. And so James says, you might say, I preach the gospel, but I live the gospel. See, you'll know my faith by my works, by what I do, because faith without works is dead. It's meaningless. See, James is my kind of guy. You know, I'm one of those guys that say talk is cheap. Don't tell me you believe in God. Show me. Show me by how you live your daily walk. And I'm not talking about coming here to church on Sunday. I'm talking about what you do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. What are you doing? Well, these guys know I'm a believer. They've asked me to pray with them when they're sick. They've asked me to visit them when they're in the hospital. And I've never one time told them I'm I'm a preacher, I'm I'm a missionary. But they know. Because they observe me. Now, that doesn't mean I'm perfect, because I'm far from perfect. And I'm about to give you a story. You'll go, okay, that's not very Christian-like. And it's not. But I came into this uh, uh, clubhouse because we, we thought we were going to be in the prizes. And I walked in, and there's this gentleman named Grumpy. He's an older gentleman, and he's a professing atheist. All right? And I don't know if he had a few too many to drink, but I walked into the clubhouse. I'm kind of giving some greetings and salutations, some of the guys there. And out of nowhere, I don't know why he did this, but he said, oh, here comes Bob. He's that guy that believes in all those fairy tales in the Bible. And he's, he's laying into me. And I was looking around like, you know, <laughs> what did I do to deserve this? And let me tell you something. I'm not one to back down to anybody. Now, if it comes to a fight now, I might run away. But when it comes to a debate or an argument, I'm the first one that jumps in. And I'm letting you know, church, I decided on that day I wasn't backing down. On that day, I know they tell you, you know, stay on the high road. For some reason, I don't know what possessed me, but I decided to jump into the mud pit and get down with this guy. This professing atheist going to attack me like this in front of everybody. Because everybody's observing this. They're waiting for me to say something. They didn't have to wait long. And I said, all right, Grumpy, you're right. Let's say, let's say that you're right. Let's say that you're correct. Let's say it is a fairy tale. There is no God. The Bible's not true. And let's say it's all about Darwinism, survival of the fittest, natural selection, and all of these things that we're taught in schools. Let's say that that is the case. God does not exist. And you die and there's nothing. You win, Grumpy. And I did like that. You win. But I said, let me tell you something. If there is a God... And he does demand worship. And there is accountability. And there is a judgment. I said, you, my friend, are royally. And I won't tell you exactly what I said. But it wasn't Christian. But it was basically, you're in trouble. And let me tell you something. It was like E.F. Hutton. These guys were drinking and they were enjoying stuff. And then all of a sudden, that whole clubhouse got quiet. You could hear a pin drop. For one, they had never heard me say that word. But it was just apropos for that day and I looked him in the eye and dead silent somebody in the back of the clubhouse he'd probably been drinking a lot too he yells out I'm with you Bob and the place erupted they all and they've been drinking now they all started going Bob 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 Graham Bob and and I just walked away and I'm going to tell you something God works in mysterious ways For some reason, that guy, that older gentleman, because he didn't have anything to say. There's no comeback to that. But from that day on, he's been so nice to me. I come to the club, how you doing, Bob? He comes, shakes my hand. See, what I did, I did something to that gentleman. I put something in the back of his mind that maybe no one had ever put in the back of his mind. What if? What if I'm wrong? See, there's not much between that gentleman in most believers. He said, come on, body, he's atheist. No, I'm being honest with you. See, I think most, as I grow older, Pastor Richie, I become a little bit more cynical. Not by design, it's just, it just the nature of it. Maybe I've watched too many episodes of Seinfeld. I don't know. I've become real cynical about things in life. I happen to think that most believers are agnostic. You say, come on now, come on, most believe. Yeah, and if you don't believe that's possible, one of the disciples was agnostic. So you come to church, you say, oh, Bob, be careful now. Pastor Richie might have to come shut you down. 
listen, one of the disciples was a devil. So to think that one of the disciples could be an agnostic, that's not a far reach, and I can prove it. See, Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. These disciples had been with Jesus. They had ministered with Jesus Christ. And now here's Jesus, and this one disciple said, that's not Jesus. Now this disciple had ministered with him. And he refused to believe that Jesus Christ has resurrected from the dead, even though he said he was. He said, the only way I'll believe that that's Jesus, if I can touch him, if I can feel his scars, and then I'll believe. And this disciple walks up and he grabs Jesus Christ and he feels him and he drops to his knees. He says, it's Jesus. And Jesus says, blessed are they who believe and have not seen. You follow me? Church, there's coming a time in your life, and I don't know if it's happened. Now, some of you aren't spring chickens, so I know it's already happened in your life. But some of you are young. I don't know if you've gotten to that crossroads where you have to make a decision. And the decision is based on this scripture. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then what happened? The Word became flesh. And we beheld His glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. His name was Jesus Christ. At some point in your life, you're going to have to make this decision. Do I think there's a God or do I know there's a God? And let me tell you something, it's going to make a difference in how you live your life. See, those who think there's a God, those who are a bit agnostic, see what they've done is they've placed most of their chips, most of their bet, their gambling, if you will, on the belief that I don't think there's a God. So my life is going to be lived for me. The things that I accumulate on this earth, the things that rust and the things that corrupt and the things that are meaningless, I am going to invest in that. I'm going to build my estate. I'm going to do, and by the way, before I go any further, there's nothing wrong with having a nice house, a nice car, a boat, and all this. There's nothing. It's a gift from above. So those people live their lives, and they say, no, I'm banking on this. But in the meantime, I'm going to place a hedge bet. And I'm going to go to church on Sunday. I might even tithe. I'm going to give a little bit to missions just in case I'm wrong. So that I can minimize my losses or guarantee some sort of victory when I stand before Almighty God. Now, in the late 1990s, I went to South Africa. And I'm going to be honest with you, I was in ministry all my life, but I'm going to tell you, all my chips weren't in. I didn't go full bore, Pastor Richie. I was hedging my bet. Now, I might have had a little bit of money, a little bit of my chips on the belief that God doesn't exist, but I was not all in. But in the late 90s, I visited South Africa. And I went with a community leader into a small village where we were conducting some AIDS research. We were trying to find the HIV prevalence rate in this community. And we'd go door to door, and we'd basically ask, you know, if any members of the family had passed away and what they had died of. Now, nobody was, nobody even to this day will admit they had HIV or they, or they died of, excuse me, they died of AIDS. But you know, people don't die of the flu. They don't necessarily die of pneumonia. These are opportunistic diseases that come in, and when you have a compromised immune system, your body does not have the ability to fight off that infection. But every home that we went into, somebody had passed away to an age-related illness. And some houses were multiple deaths. But then we got into a household where there was no one in there but children. I said, well, who, who, who lives here? No, these children. There was a child of about maybe 13. There was maybe a sibling that might have been six and five. 
And this community leader is telling me that this home was child-headed because their parents had passed away and there was no one to care for them. And I'm telling you right now, as, as a person, not as a believer, but just as a person in general, the physical thing that happened to me because I was an American living in this country. This, it's a great country. I know we got our problem. We live in a great country. And I know we have what so-called latchkey children and things like that. I had never, ever in my life gone into a home in the United States where children were living by themselves. And it affected me where I had trouble breathing physically. I had to walk away. And let me tell you something, when I came back to the United States, I could not get those images of those children out of my mind. Now, I'd still go to work, I'd still coach games, but at night, when all that stuff was gone and I was in my bed, I would toss and turn thinking about those kids. And finally, I just said, hey, that's it. I told Joanna, I said, listen, I think God wants us to go and do something. Now, at the time, I had no clue what I was going to do. I had to spend several years researching. I went back to South Africa and I visited orphanages and child and youth care centers and I tried to come up with an idea of what would be effective. And then I realized that Southern Africa was the home of the greatest resource in the fight against this orphan crisis. Because at that time, which is about you know, 15 years ago, there was an estimated 500,000 families in South Africa that were child-headed. Half a million children raising themselves. And I said, my goodness, where is the government? And of course, that's, a, that's the wrong question ever to ask. You never ask that question, okay, especially when it comes to child. It's just a bad, it's a bad question in general to say, where is the government? But then I thought, well, where is the church of Jesus Christ? And even that was a terrible question because the Holy Spirit said, well, Bob, aren't you a believer? Aren't you a Christian? Before you throw rocks at the church and the government, what are you doing about it? I said, God, I just can't win. But then I said, I'm going. And Joanna was already ready to go. She's a missionary. She grew up on the mission. She was a missionary kid. So she's like, when are we going? I said, I don't know. I don't know how we're going to take care of ourselves financially. I have no idea, but I asked God, give me wisdom, God. And God gave me wisdom. See, I could have asked him for a million dollars, but that would have been a mistake. I asked him for something far greater. I said, God, give me wisdom. And immediately God gave me the wisdom to start a charity, start a 501c3, go to a mission agency, see if they'll sponsor what you're doing so you and your wife can be pay for your bills, because we have an organization called the Children's Resiliency Project. It's a 501c3, and guess what? Nobody associated with our charity collects any type of salary or gets any kind of financial remuneration for their efforts, including me and Joanna. Now, try to explain that to the IRS. When they asked me about that plan, I had to explain to them what missionaries do. I said, my wife and I are missionaries. So we get our support from local churches so that we can go to South Africa and we can take our charity money and build houses and support these grandmothers to raise these children. And so that's what we've been doing for the last 17 years. Why? Why did I go? Because I had to make a decision. Either God exists or he doesn't exist. I'm either going to live by faith not knowing how we're going to pay these bills, how we're going to buy land, how we're going to do these things. Sort of like, you know, got out of the boat, if you will. Now, you can stay in the boat, but if you stay in the boat, church, you'll never walk on water. You know, you follow me. And also, you'll never please an almighty God because there's only one way, according to the scriptures, one way in your life that you can please almighty God. I've read the scriptures. There's only one way. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Did you hear that? I didn't make, that's not Bob. That word says impossible. So if you're not living somehow a life of faith, you're not pleasing God. Now, I don't know what that is, whether it's faith with your finances, faith with your job, with your, with your service. But you know if you're living by faith. You know if you're stepping out and saying, really, I don't have it but I'm still gonna give it. That's faith. I don't know what my abilities are, but I'm in. I'm, I'm gonna volunteer. I've never helped in a children's ministry in my life, but I, I'm gonna go. See, that's faith. 
So you're going to get out of the boat. And by getting out of the boat, God's going to allow you to walk on water. Since we started this ministry, are you ready for this church? I'm just a normal Joe. I'm just like you. We've raised about $3.7 million. We're debt-free. We owe nobody any money. If we do stuff in South Africa, we help other organizations. We only do it because we have the resources. If we don't have the resources, we don't do it. And we started that way. And as far as I'm concerned, see, God will let you live by faith. God will let you get in debt if you'd like. You can live by faith that way. Or God will let you use cash. I just chose, let's, let's try to stay on a cash basis and just see how that works. See, God, see, God owns everything. He's going to test your faith by what, by what you stepping out. And now what I want to share with you is many of you, and Pastor Richie is one of these, they've been investing in our ministry for years. See, it's called seed. You know what I mean? And let me tell you something. I'm looking at some older people out there. Where I'm, in your, I'm in your category. I'm, 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 listen, I'm, tomorrow I'm not, I don't got one foot in the grave, but I'm, I'm moving that direction. And the older you get, you know what you start thinking about? You start thinking about spiritual stuff. So you're, not, you're no longer a teenager where you're thinking about yourself. and Some other things you probably shouldn't be thinking about. You start thinking about, hey, you know what? <laughs> what is my life meant? And you, you young people, you start looking at these older folks. You know what they're doing with their lives? They've got a little seed, and every now and then they'll throw that seed out. Now, they might not live a long, long enough to see that seed grow. And definitely might not see that seed basically to the point where it needs to be cultivated and then obviously harvested. But they're still throwing that seed because there are young people here today. You're going to harvest the seed that our seniors have planted. But because we've been in this ministry for this long, we've got some harvesting. We've got some fruit. And I'm going to share that with you today. Let's start with our, some of our younger fruit. Let's start with Pumi. Now, Pumi is on the right here. Now, she came to us about a year and a half ago. Some of our kids have gone through. See, if you're expecting to see a bunch of munchkins when you come visit our children's village, remember, we've had these kids for 15, 16, 17 years. They're teenagers. Some of them are in college. But we have, sometimes when they go and they leave, we have some empty beds, so we bring in other kids. Well, Pumi came in with her siblings uh, a few, uh, you know, a year and a half ago. And at this stage in our ministry, we're just kind of, you know, we're just I mean, almost going through the motions. We've been doing it so long. And I'm going to be honest with you. I have grandkids here in the States now. My three children live here in the States. And sometimes we get weary and well-doing because there's a part of us who wants to be back here. Not to hang out with Pastor Richie. You know, I can, I can go, I, we can FaceTime. But just so my grandkids know who I am, so I can tickle them, so I can see my boy go through college. And we get depressed. But God, he, he, he knows that. And so every now and then he says, you know, I need to encourage Bob and Joanna. And I'm going to encourage them through Pumi. Pumi wrote us a note about four, four months ago, right in the stage where we're kind of going through the motion. I want you to see this note. Now, we've posted this note online. That's why we've taken her name out. Well, there's a lot of child trafficking that goes on. But I want you to read. Now, I know her English is not, but you've got to remember, she went to a Zulu school, and she's just now going to a school where she's learning how to speak English. But let me tell you something, it's, it's good enough. She says, love mom for saving my life. I am Pumi, love for saving my family. I didn't ask her to write that note. She asked her granny, can I write a note? They call us mommy and daddy by default. See, they've lost their mothers and fathers, most of them. They have aunties, they have grannies, they have extended family. They don't have a mommy and daddy. So by default, they just call us mommy and daddy. So she wrote this note, and I'm like, oh, if I'm weary and well-doing, just let me move forward. I also like to take a, pictures of birds. I photographed over 850 species of birds. If you've seen a bird here in this county, I've photographed it, okay? I don't care what type of bird it is, I've photographed it. And in South Africa, I photographed about 650 species of birds, including this one. This is called an emerald cuckoo. Okay, now, I'm not going to tell you much about the emerald cuckoo, but it's a prized bird. If you've spotted an emerald cuckoo and you've been able to photograph people, that bird, they're, they're called twitchers. 
Now, Twitcher, so you're going to learn something in church today. You learn how to gamble, now you're going to learn about twitching. Twitching is a European term for where you, you see a bird, you check it off. It's a lifer. So you got a list of birds that you've twitched. Some guys are in the thousands of birds they've seen in their lives, some men and women. I'm not there yet, but I'm working my way. But I've certainly seen this bird, and I've certainly photographed it. And people have found out about it because I post them. I have various websites that I'm, a, that I'm a part of. Some of my birds are in these, these book, book guides, these bird guides, over, just over the years. But I know this bird like the back of my hand because it's right there where we live. So when they come, when they come during the migratory season, I, I follow them. I, I chart their movements. And I'm in uh, Johannesburg, which is about 400 miles from where we live. Let me show you how God intervenes in the affairs of mankind. I'm out there taking pictures of some eagles on the side of this mountain near this waterfall. And I'm photographing the gentleman walks up and he says, are you getting good pictures? I said, well, we need to move up higher so we can get eye level with these black eagles. So we move up and we're chit-chatting and, you know, we're saying things. And I'm taking a few more photos. And I just mentioned, he said, oh, this would be a great photo for me to post. And he looks at me and says, uh, mask." I ask who you, what your name is? Because we had never really formally, oh, I said, I'm Bob Graham. He said, oh, man, I thought you were somebody else. I said, well, who do you think I was? He said, there's this Robert Graham. And I said, well, that's me. He said, oh, is that you? He said, listen, I live near you. He said, and you photographed this beautiful emerald cuckoo. I've, I've heard that bird. I've never really, I've never really seen that bird. Could you, could you take me to see it? I said, sure. I said, I'll be home after Christmas. We'll go about 5.30 in the morning. I'll track their movements and we'll see them. So we fast forward to right after Christmas, uh, about a few years ago. And uh, I'm walking and talking with him. And, and, and then, then our, here he comes because it's a noisy bird. The cuckoos, cuckoos, you know, you say cuckoo, cuckoo. Th th these birds make those type of noises. They're cuckoo, and they're, by the way, they're wild. They're crazy birds, okay? Read about cuckoos. You'll be surprised at how crazy. That's why they call cuckoos. But anyway, we see this bird, and now he's photographing this bird. He's saying, thank you so much. I appreciate, you know, you showing me this bird. Now, in the process, this whole COVID thing, and I, that's a whole other issue altogether. But I think some of the uh, COVID was a real, it's a real virus. But some of the decisions that these governments made were ludicrous. How many times do you think in a, a government cabinet meeting this statement was said about the COVID rules? Oh, we didn't think about that. And we certainly didn't think about the poor and the needy. And in South Africa, these because most of them are government hospitals, they just shut down everything. If you weren't dying and cut open, they, uh, you needed all oh, this, this uh, you don't, we can hold on. And they just suspended all of these important surgeries. One of them was cataract surgery. We have one of our aunties, she can't see. She's got cataracts. She just sees a big blur. So we're saying, well, well we're trying to get a surgery. And they said, no, we've suspended all those surgeries. So basically, you just go blind until, we, until this COVID thing passes over. And now the waiting list is not a year. It's not two years. It's like four years. If they want a government hospital, she's going to have to wait four years to have cataract surgery. And we've called the Catholic hospital, and there's about a two-year waiting list. So, oh, brother, got a granny raising kids, can't even see. Our Heavenly Father knew that. So when I'm burdened with this gentleman, I said, well, Doc, I said, you know, Ed, what do you do for a living? He says, I'm an ophthalmologist. An ophthalmologist? That was January last year. This is April this is April of that same year. If you go to Dr. Anderson, guess what's happening here, church? You can't make this stuff up. You know, I know a lot of preachers sometimes when they preach, they tend to embellish their stories to make it work. Heck, I do that. I embellished some stories about Richie yesterday, you know, because they work. You can't make this stuff up. You can only mess it up. Here is Dr. Anderson by the end of April, we have an auntie who's taking care of other people's children that can see now. And when she found out that she had, she, not when she had surgery, she found out she was having a consultation. She came to Joanna and, and tears rolling down her eyes and hugging Joanna. I said, see, this is how God works if you live by faith. Next picture. 
This one starts in a Shabin. Now, Shabin is an African tavern. You know, I don't care if it's in the ghettos of America or the slums of Soweto in South Africa. A couple things you're going to have in these poor areas, you're going to have some taverns. You're going to have some alcohol. You might not have a hospital. You might not have a grocery store, but you're going to have a bar. And you're going to have a place where you can gamble. That's another issue altogether. But this one starts in a Shabin. Thirteen years ago, a lady finds out that she's HIV positive. And, uh, and, and at that time, I mean, it, to most people, it's a death sentence. Now, today, it's not. If you have access to antiretroviral drugs, you can have HIV, and you can keep your CD4 count above 200. Basically, I'm not a doctor, you know, like not a medical doctor. If your CD4 count's below 200, you're in trouble. You have AIDS which means your body doesn't have the ability to fight off infection. But if your CD4 account is above 200, ours is in the thousands. But if you can get it above 200, your body will have the ability to fight off infection. And these antiretroviral drugs that are throughout the world, uh, they're life-saving drugs. But at this time, it's a, some people, it's a death sentence. So this woman walks in the Shabin with her child, and she sets her child down by some total strangers and said, Listen, I've got to use the toilet. Can somebody watch my child just for a few minutes? And of course, who wouldn't, you know, who, who wouldn't do that? They agree to uh, uh, watch this child. She steps up in the bathroom. She never comes back out. That child makes way to social development, child welfare, and to, to me and Joanna. We hear the case study and said, no, we've got a granny that can take, take care of him. Now, Seasway... I'm the only father he has. I like to go birding, Pastor Richie. I like to take pictures of birds. Guess who else likes to take pictures of birds? A Seasway. Take a look at this next photo. Here's a Seasway now. He's going to his first high, high year of high school. I take a lot of my kids camping and birding, but most of them just want to come with me because they, they want to eat pizza and they want to go out camping. A Seasway wants to go birding. He wants to find the bird. He wants to photograph the bird. He, he knows the bird call. Matter of fact, sometimes he aggravates me because he can make some of those calls, and I'll be walking. He'll make a call, and I'll go, I'll go, hey, I heard it, heard it, heard it. He said, it's over here, it's over here. So I'm like, where is it? He'll back up. He'll make a call, and I'll go, oh, that's you. And he'll laugh. See, his mother decided to take her life, but God had plans for a seasway, and it's not even finished yet. Last story. You understand? This is fruit. You guys who've been investing in our ministry, all I'm doing today is just sharing you some of the fruit. I can't share all the fruit with you. We'd be, we're already fat enough as it is. I'm just giving you a little bit of fruit. But we're enjoying it because this is, this is real life. This is stuff that's happened. Richie, you said, yes, 17 years ago. I'm just trying to tell you, listen, it's the, it, it, the fruit is there. Last story. This is an incredible story. You can't make this stuff up. This story takes place in an abandoned field north of where we live. We got some kids in here, so I won't get into all the details, but just understand that most of the kids that come to our children's village that are under six years old, horrific things have happened to them. Horrific things. Most of you, I know you don't have your head in the sand, but the San Goma, the witch doctors, it's pagan, and that's why we try to educate people, but there's a philosophy that they teach that if you're HIV positive, that if you have relations with virgins, you can eradicate yourself of HIV. And it's being taught. So these men, to make sure that that criteria is met, they go after toddlers. And about 20 years ago, they found a toddler, and they did horrific things to this toddler, and they threw her in a field north of where we live to die. They were done with her. We did our business. Let her die. And they walk away. But God's providence church is powerful. A police helicopter doing a routine patrol over this area. One of the pilots spotted this toddler's lifeless body. They landed the helicopter and they take this toddler, helicopter, hospital, surgery, and then back to the township with the police and social service said, whose child is this? And unfortunately, and I hope her mother never seen this. I hope her mother was, we don't know. 
But they say when this happens to the child, everybody will deny the child. Well, that child is placed into foster care, goes from a children's home to foster care to Endowia Timba Children's Village, us. And after this child was at our children's village for several years, I get a knock on my door. It's her grandmother, with little Yand at that time, wanting to speak to me and Joanna. And this is all she wanted to know. See, she had found out, even though she was an orphan child, she had found out that she has an earthly father, a father that would never deny her. And she wanted to know how she could receive her heavenly father as her savior. And there in our living room, she trusted Jesus Christ as her savior. And later that, that next Easter, she was baptized. This is a yonder today. This is, this is, yes. This is her senior prom. Now, her, her, her boyfriend, he was there, but, you know, he ain't in the circle, you know. He ain't in the circle yet, so I don't have a picture of him up to show you. I just want, this is Yonda. I'm not saying he was a bad guy, but, you know, he ain't in the circle. But Yonda is now at a university about 200 miles from us studying to be a teacher. Church, I want you to read these last two verses as Pastor Richie comes. Church, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, I don't know what you've been taught about the judgment seat of Christ, but when I was growing up, I was told it's like a big award ceremony. They're going, Jesus is going to pass out some crowns. But then I read the next verse. It says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. I don't know about you, I've never been to an award ceremony where the word terror was used. Disappointment maybe, but not the word terror. Church, you and me, if we believe God exists, there's coming a day when all of us as Christians are gonna stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of our lives. Now I'm a circle with the, with the zero rubbed out. I'm a nobody. But you know what, Joanna and I decided 17, 18 years ago, we're all in. All of our finances, all of our talents, all of our time, and we're going to invest in orphan and abandoned children because of this one fact, because we believe that one day we're going to have to stand before Jesus Christ. He gave his life for us. Now, he's not asking us to die for him. He never has asked that. I'm willing. I'm willing to die for Christ. But he's never asked me that. But he has asked me, Bob, would you live for me? Will you live for me? And church, I don't know what you're doing to lay up treasures in heaven. Some of you are young, maybe that's not so important to you now, but some of us who are more senior oriented, we're thinking about that day. And I'm asking you church, even if you're young, let's start getting some seed out there. Because one of these days we're gonna stand before Christ and I wanna be able to present to him when he says, Bob, you're next. I wanna be able to say, Jesus Christ, because of who you are, not because of who I am, Here's a Seasway, here's a Yonda. I want all you children to come forward. I want you to bring your husbands, your wives, your, your children, and I'm just gonna present them at the altar. Church, we've gotta get seed in the ground. We're living in the last days, I'm convinced of it, and we just need to ready. And God is not, again, God's not asking you to die for him, he's just asking you to live for him. Let's consider that. Let's quit hedging our bets. Let's decide God does exist, and I need to get business with God. All right. Thank you so much. What a challenge. How are you living? What are you investing? What are you giving to the Lord? We, we believe that here. We talk about it a lot. And my prayer is for all in the room and all online, that we give what is in our hand. What God has given us, what God has placed in our hand is that we give it to Him. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd uh, help us today uh, as a church, as individuals, Lord, to be able to, to give to you, just like the little boy that gave his lunch to Jesus so he could feed the 5,000. We wanna give to you what is in our hand. Just like Moses had a staff in his hand God, you used it. Lord, help us to give what's in our hand to you. 
Now, before I finish my prayer, if today you'd like to receive Christ as your Savior, uh, that's a very simple thing. You ask. Ask God to save you. If you do that today, mark it on your card. If you're in the room, if you're online, uh, click the button at the bottom of the screen, and you can let us know that you pray to receive Christ today. Say something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the grave, and I'm asking you to save me right now. Let us know. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us today to give everything to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to ask our ushers to come. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to take an offering for Bob and Joanna. Man, I know that we've supported them over the years, but this is a special opportunity. And I'm going to tell you how you can do this. And ushers, just wait for a second. You just come and stand. Just wait for a second. Uh, I'm going to tell you how you can give. You can give cash, obviously, or uh, you can give a check. Uh, not many people carry a checkbook anymore. I realize that. Uh, but if you're one of the few that does, you can write a check. Um, or if you have cash. Now, I don't normally carry cash in my wallet with me. Um, but there are other ways you can give. You can text the number 84321. All right, you can text that number. Now, if you'd like to give, here's what you do. You put the number first, 50, if you're going to give $50. 10, if you're going to give $10. 100, if you're going to give 100. 1,000, if you're going to give 1,000. Whatever number it is, you put that number, and then you put hope, H-O-P-E. Anything designated to that today, we know, will go to Bob and Joanna. All right, or you can do the exact same thing in the church app, okay? So you can uh, open your church app, you can put the number in, and you can uh, choose which fund you give to. You choose Hope, and that will help us uh, as we give an offering to this couple. And uh, aren't these wonderful stories? Did you enjoy that today? Man, that was fantastic, wasn't it? And so, ushers, go ahead and pass the buckets. If anybody has cash or a check that you'd like to give, you can give uh, as they pass these uh, this morning. Uh, don't forget now about next steps. We do this every Sunday. You can take your next step. If you're new, fill out the next step card. Let us know that you're here, and we'll follow up with you. If you'd like to take a next step of being baptized, indicate that on the card. Or if you'd like to join a small group or you'd like to serve in some way, let us know that's the next step. And then, of course, at the end of the service, to my left and your right, you can see the table over here. Uh, we have communion available for anybody that would like that. We have our prayer team that's there. We're going to be doing this every Sunday from now on. If you'd like prayer, we're going to have prayer team people over here that will pray with you before you leave. Uh, if you'd like to take communion on the days that we don't have communion church-wide, you can take it right over here at this table. So the prayer is for anybody. Uh, anybody that has some request you'd like these people to pray for you about, for example, if it's a health problem, if it's a family issue, if you're praying for someone to be saved, you're praying for someone at your work, whatever it is, you can go there and there'll be someone there to pray with you. Okay? All right. Well, we got a lot accomplished today in spite of a lot of people not being here because of time change and the weather. I am so glad that you are here. And so God bless you. I love you. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next Sunday. Have a great week. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.